Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sustainable Development Impact Summit. Well, my name is Eric White. I lead a project at the World Economic Forum called Internet for All, the goal of which is to create hundreds of millions of new internet users. Now, as many of you may be aware, there's about 3.9 billion people in the world at the moment that aren't online. That's more than half the world. And we see this as a problem. So not only are there numerous economic benefits to being online, but we know that as the world moves further and further into the fourth industrial revolution and the global economy becomes digital, these people are going to be left further and further behind if they're not online. So the forum, the forum has an idea as to what needs to happen to move this issue forward. A study we undertook in 2016 with the Boston Consulting Group identified four barriers to internet access and adoption. It's not just about infrastructure. It's also about affordability of data and of devices. It's about relevant content. It's about something that we've called skills, awareness, and cultural acceptance. It's a multifaceted problem, and multifaceted problems require coordinated solutions, which is why we think that multi-stakeholder collaboration is one of the most important things we can do to increase internet access and adoption. So through the Internet for All project, we try to solve this coordination problem at the global level and at the country level so that we can create partnerships to create new solutions that can bring people online. We have country programs going right now in Rwanda, in South Africa, in Argentina, and in Jordan with more to come in 2018. And we're putting this together into a methodology that will help governments be able to implement the approach without our support. We also coordinate working groups at the global level, at the global level on themes like skills or financing connectivity infrastructure. And I tell you this so that you know that there is an infrastructure in place to take forward the ideas that we generate today so that they can make an impact more quickly. And make no mistake, that's why we're here, is because we want to make an impact. This is the Sustainable Development Impact Summit. So let's think about what we can do to make an impact. What partnerships can we propose? What projects can we develop? And that's our purpose here today. So to guide you through this creative process, I'd like to introduce Njadeka Harry, who's going to be our overall moderator of the session. Um, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction, Eric. It's certainly an honor to be here uh, with you all this morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, with me today, I have, uh, of course, four distinguished um, panelists that we will be hearing from a little bit later on. But uh, just wanted very quickly also to tell you a little bit about the format of this session. We would spend uh, the first 30 minutes or so uh, addressing some key questions, three key questions of the panelists around uh, ways in which they look to bringing more affordable and accessible internet connectivity into their countries in collaborations and partnerships, of course, with multi-stakeholder groups. After which we will break out into four uh, separate breakout groups, um, which, which you see at the back of the room, and the uh, subject areas for those groups are identified in the agenda. And this will really serve as an inspiration to having concrete discussions and uh, to coming up with viable solutions as to how we can address the issue of achieving internet for all. And so that's really the format of how this would go. Um, with that, I would like to introduce uh, Mark Sturman. Thanks for the welcome, and uh, great to have our distinguished panel and all of you here on these important issues. Uh, I'm Mark Sturman. I'm executive director of Mozilla Foundation, uh, people who make Firefox. Um, and you know, in addition to making open source software, we actually really believe that this agenda the idea of a healthy internet that is good for everyone is probably one of the most pressing issues of our time. Uh, it's certainly pressing for people who are coming online, the billions of people who are going to be coming online over the next 10 years. Uh, but it's also pressing for, for all of us, whether it's you know, fake news and misinformation or data breaches that we have seen happen. You know, really, as all of humanity gets on the internet, what happens on the internet actually shapes the economy, shapes how our lives work, shapes democracy. 
And if we don't pay attention to these issues now, which I think are well outlined in, in WEF's research, uh, we are going to have a less equal and I would argue less stable society as a result of the internet. Now, of course, there's tremendous opportunity, and, and there is one session on the, the dark side of the internet, I think, in the breakout. So if you, if you want to look at what bad might happen, come to that. Um, but I think you know, all of us are here because we believe there is tremendous opportunity, and I certainly believe that, and Mozilla believes that. Uh, but we only see that opportunity by being conscious and having a real intent around it. Uh, and I think multi-stakeholder partnership can be one of the ways we express that intent and move the ball if we're for real and if we put real energy into it. So I'll say a little bit about what I think is the potential of the internet for all in a second. But just to talk about you know, sort of what I mean by that, one of the things I did, I don't know, I'm getting very old, probably 15 years ago almost, uh, was run a consortium of Microsoft, the Canadian government and the Swiss government on telecenters and community cyber cafes. Uh, it was called telecenter.org. And why I tell the story of telecenter.org is it, it really was a bunch of organizations plus governments around the world, plus people running uh, community cyber cafes in 40 countries coming together to say we need to actually get the most out of the investments in community ICT that everybody has made for people because we weren't seeing the return on investment. And between us, we put in $25 million, we built out networks in 40 countries, and really boldly said, we have to step up and do that. And you know, we had a lot of impact in terms of increased value for telecenters. Of course, the smartphone came along, so imagine 15 years ago, we didn't quite have the same devices in our pockets, and changed what we need to think about. But the issues of equity, the issues of value for people are still here today. In fact, they're bigger than they were 15 years ago. And we need that kind of bold coalition in order to be successful. So if you think about that in terms of the WEF report, and I'll just kind of wrap up with, with a bit of a call to action, we have those four issues. What would it look like to act boldly on them? So just take digital skills you know, for one. I think we need to build a coalition where we have a chance. Maybe we don't care. Maybe we're just going to talk. Uh, but I think we have a chance with the Internet for All to build a coalition of governments, of companies, of nonprofits who actually want to tackle this issue in a big, big way. And we've started to do that, the work that's happening in Rwanda, which we're working with the, the minister, and you'll hear from him, Digital Opportunity of Trust with WEF, to build out digital ambassadors that will train five million people. That's what can happen, but that's just one small country. And you know, we're talking with the DQ Institute in Singapore, who's also here today. You know, they have trained 500,000 young people in a very kind of impressive way on how to tackle digital literacy that isn't about just learning to code, it's about every child having digital intelligence. And you know, that's something that, again, if we had phone companies, if we had governments working on that, we could really scale up. And so I think we, we need here to kind of seize that opportunity. You know, what I can imagine two, three years from now is you know, dozens of com companies phone companies offering their stores, their marketing budgets, their platforms to help us get out to first time users, you know, the big platform players like Facebook or Google helping us build digital literacy into their products. And of course, you know, great nonprofits and government partners uh, helping it bring it to the people. Uh, I think we can do that, um, but it will involve real action. And so the specific action you know, here is think about how you and your organization could plug in and if your company, think about asking your CEO to come to Davos with this at the top of their agenda. And if you're working in government, do the same with your ministers. And really, we need to bring this to the top of the agenda if we're going to be serious about moving it on. Uh, and you know, this is the, the only kind of people who can do it is us. And nobody else is going to do it. So thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. So thank you so much for that uh, introduction. And yes, the uh, onus is really in our hands, uh, working together to ensure that we are bringing the right people to have the right conversations at, at the right time. Because access and affordability are, are critical. We know that you know, by 2025, only about 60% of the jobs that are going to exist in that time our young people today only have 20% of those skills to fill those jobs. And connectivity and education, of course, form a 
core component on ensuring that these young people can keep up with 21st century skills. Half of the world today, 50%, uh, almost 3.9 billion people are still offline. And many of those people are women as well as girls living in developing countries um, who use the internet and have access to it as much as 25% less than boys and male counterparts. So there are about you know, 600 million women and, and girls in developing countries that still do not have this access. But access also comes with affordability. And the high cost of the internet, of course, is excluding billions from this digital revolution. In terms of cost, in Africa, a continent where the organization that I work for, Youth for Technology Foundation, does a tremendous amount of work Connectivity is still expensive. And in Africa, about one gigabyte of data, statistics has shown that um, that's about 18% of an end user's monthly income, compared to Latin America, where it's about 3.7%, and then Asia, where it's about 4.2% of average monthly income. So these conversations are so important and bringing the right players to the forefront um, to come up with effective solutions. I have the honor today of introducing my distinguished panel to form a part of this conversation. On the panel with me today, we have to my left, Minister Nsegimana of Rwanda, Minister Anusha Khan of Pakistan, Mr. Khan Terziolu, the Chief Executive Officer of Turkcell, as well as Minister Zunaid Ahmed Palak of Bangladesh. Each of these ministers is going to spend a few minutes helping us address three critical questions. The first being how a multi-stakeholder approach related to your coalition is unlocking additional resources, innovation, and increasing scale. If you can just share with us, ministers, what are the actors, whether within the government, investors, experts, or the private sector, would help take this effort to the next level? And then finally, as we look across the issue at large, who are the game players that are actually missing? I'd like to start with Minister Nsegimana of Rwanda. According to the Alliance for Affordable Internet in the Affordability, uh, Affordability Index report produced in 2016, Rwanda ranked number one on that index, looking at least developed countries in terms of affordability and access. Last night, I had the privilege of attending a session which you spoke at um, in relation to urban cities, where you explicitly mentioned that this initiative around affordability and accessibility starts with the leaders, and in Rwanda, leading by example. We've seen just a tremendous amount of progress in the country over the last couple of years. President Kagame sitting on the Broadband Commission. It's one of very few countries that actually has uh, the gender piece of things as part of your ICT policy. Your leading efforts around the Northern Corridor. Can you just share with us why are these efforts important and what sorts of outcomes are you hoping to achieve in years to come? <coughs> Thank you and uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, we are doing all this because we do believe that uh, broadband uh, internet use does accelerate development and does accelerate inclusive development if we do it correctly. So I'd like to reflect a little bit on, on the point made by Mark in the introduction, which made me realize that actually my lifetime fight has been internet for all. I set up the first telecenter in Rwanda back in 2001, which failed. 
but today we have more than 1,500 uh, public access points which allow the people to access a range of uh, uh, services. But I want to believe that one of the initiatives that we are doing today can finally bring victory. And that initiative is a, a digital ambassadors program. Because of the four big barriers that we talked about, which will really unleash the power of technology in our economy. Uh, we talked about infrastructure, we talked about content, we talked about you know, affordability, but we believe we are on the way to win uh, the battle on, on connectivity. And, and I believe that of the four billion that are remain to be connected, not many people know that actually two billion out of the four have, live already under an area that is connected, I mean covered by 2G or 3G or sometimes 4G, but they are not connected. So the real fight for us, it's been clear for a number of years now, has to shift for just mere coverage of, of infrastructure and access to the more soft uh, factors, uh, that is digital awareness and skills, and then which will in turn drive, that is something that actually can allow us to kill three birds at a time. The first one is investment, because when you create digital consumers who are digitally literate, then invest, investments will follow where demand is. The second bird is, a go, uh, is going to be around jobs. So the Digital Ambassadors Program is about unleashing the power and innovation of these young people who go to the communities and transform everyone into a digital consumer. So finally, it's impact because the more we empower digitally these people, the more they can go online and use government services which are there. Uh, for your information, we are driving at least 95% of all government transactions by end of this year will be online. Uh, it's, it's about education. People will take advantage of uh, digital education. We'll uh, move trade, especially the small and medium enterprises the women uh, entrepreneurs who are out there who can now start selling their things online, and, and healthcare. So three birds with one stone, which is digital uh, awareness and digital literacy. So coming back to your question, um, we believe that we've found an initiative that is truly multi-stakeholder. I, I, I can look at Janet Longmore, who's sitting here, a, a good partner as part of that coalition that is uh, driving digital literacy. Um, and it's something that no one player can do alone. Whereas a telecom um, company can come with money and invest and cover their market alone, uh, just working with the regulator, you cannot drive digital literacy in a country alone. You need uh, education ministry, you need IT ministry, you need community-based organizations, uh, you need the young people, the youth ministry, which I used to co-lead with IT ministry. So you need all these players, and then you need the telecom players. You need an ecosystem around that for you to be successful. Okay. So, Minister, it sounds like you, you know, your, your country, Rwanda, has, has done a good job in that respect, really bringing together these multi-stakeholder partners to deliver value for the consumer, in this case, the young people and providing the right education platform. You mentioned, you know, digital ambassadors providing these digital skills, and we now know we are in a gig economy. I'd like to come back to that uh, maybe in the, in, the, in the second round, but if I can just uh, move on to, to, Minister, um, to Minister Anusha Khan of, of Pakistan, uh, sitting, to your, sitting to your left there, and thank you, Minister, for being here with us today. We know there's been tremendous uh, progress um, in Pakistan over the last couple of years um, in regards to the digital space and access to the internet. I'm specifically uh, interested in hearing from you in addressing some of these questions regarding you know, the multi-stakeholder approach, how you're involving private sector and other players, as well as which game-changing changing players are, are not there yet that you would like to see. Um, there is not a lot of information out there regarding where Pakistan is on, on development of spectrum and, and the transparency around that. If you don't mind sharing a little bit of that also, um, that would be great. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me on the panel. 
Um, yes, in the last uh, three odd years, uh, there has been a stupendous lead that Pakistan has taken in terms of getting connected, connecting the unconnected. And this has been the ambition of the Prime Minister to, uh, to reach out to the underserved and unserved areas. And we have used around $440 million roughly to reach out to the far-flung areas of the country, providing the first layer, which is the infrastructure. So now by 2018, December, I can claim that there would be no 100 population village which will be unconnected. So we have rolled out the programs, we have given out the projects, and those projects are being done as a public-private partnership. I think what Pakistan is leading today, uh, by example, is a public-private partnership model to roll out infrastructure throughout the country. So all those areas which do not have a commercial sense for the telecom operators, we are using the Universal Service Fund within uh, cooperation and through the private sector, deploying infrastructure in those areas. But the important part is that once even when you have given the infrastructure, you have laid the optic fiber cable, you have given the 3G, 4G technology, you have made it, the access has been given. Whether the technology is actually being used by those people is the question, because these are the legards. They're not even the first movers, they're not even the second movers. They're the really legards, the people who either can't afford it or who probably don't even have the skill how to use it. Literacy is an issue. Uh, in fact, it's a major issue. So a lot of things that technology brings on the plate require certain level of training, require certain level of literacy, uh, it requires certain level of awareness. It requires, and more than that, it requires affordability. Although Pakistan is one of, I think, in the top three countries where the telecom services are most affordable, but still, uh, we have found that getting them to use the technology despite affordable rates is a challenge. So when we have done the connectivity, um, and by 2018, I would have covered the entire country of the population of 100. We have in parallel now completing the supply side of the infrastructure, started working on the demand side. Because still the demand is created, the technology itself is not going to bring the revolution that we all want to see. How we put the technology to use is what is going to bring out the difference. So I've started a program called ICT for Girls, for example, focusing on the women and girls and, and realizing that we need to give them the digital skills. I rolled out the program ICT for Girls, teaching them how to do coding and cloud computing uh, in partnership with Microsoft. So on, on one side, whilst I partner with the telcos to roll out the infrastructure in the underserved, unserved areas of the country, I partner with companies like Microsoft to teach them how to do Minecraft, how to teach them to teach them how to do coding and ma and make them use to teach them how to use these skills to work from home because pakistan is today ranked as number 4 in freelancing so my focus is that to increase their skill and to increase and to teach them by teaching them how to code what we are enabling them to do is to be able to work from home so this program is, for example, uh, first I rolled out in 150 the, 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 the women empowerment centers, which are for the most devastated segment of the society. So the girls in 150 empowerment centers, start, we equipped them with computer labs, connectivity, provided them Microsoft the teachers and everything. They were trained by Microsoft. We scaled up this program to the Islamabad public sector schools. 226 public sector schools are now being given computer labs together with Microsoft coding training. What we would be doing 110,000 girls every year through this program, teaching them how to do coding and cloud computing, et cetera. Okay. But even when, we, even when we see that the girls are getting a special focus and they would be uh, getting the dividends, this is not enough. What countries need to do, and you asked about who are the important stakeholders, the, the most important stakeholder actually is at the leadership level, everyone. If you talk to me, I have to identify one, I can say, starting from the top leadership, your prime minister or the president, it comes right from there, the governments have to, they have to play the lead role in bringing together all other stakeholders who are 
in the scheme of the things of executing the mission of making a digital Pakistan or digital Rwanda or digital if any country that is on the digital path. If as an enabler, Ministry of IT will provide the infrastructure, if the education ministry is not going to use it for digital literacy, it's going to be of no use. If the health ministry is not going to use it for e-health or m-health, it's going to be of no use. If the security companies are not going to use it for e-security and so on and so forth. So all the respective domains are governed by the respective divisions, departments and ministries. So the awareness and the usability of technology, the realization is unfortunately not that vibrant as it would be in the Ministry of IT, for example. So the most important stakeholders are the people who are governing their countries for the last many decades in one form. They used paper all their life. They, they do not appreciate and understand the benefits of using technology right. for more transparency, efficiency, and so on. And there needs to be a change management altogether, in, particularly in the developing countries. And this is the most important task. Right. Because once you could do e-governance, and once you could bring out all the, uh, the stakeholders on board, then it's an easy thing. So whatever the Ministry of IT needs to do, they would do it. But if the Ministry of Education does not come forward and adopts it, it will be the breakage of the value chain. And I just want to say that even when the ICTs and the technologies are realized as one of the most key factors for attaining growth. This realization requires uh, the importance of con connecting the people at the highest level as important as an SDG goal. Absolutely. Which it is not there. Absolutely. So no funding is available for, to people for connecting. Right. That, right. So, so Minister Khan, a lot of the points you mentioned are, are really interesting. Coincidentally, on, on my away here this morning, I, I happened to um, have a wonderful Uber driver from Pakistan and we had a conversation about connectivity. And uh, interestingly, in terms of cost and access, like you mentioned, in terms of affordability, he mentioned broadband uh, somewhere around 1,500 rupees a month, which you know he thought was not exorbitant by any means. But the point that you mentioned about, it's not just about the access, it's about what do we do when we do have the access, and that's where education comes in and that's where really integrating those multi-stakeholder partners, the private sector, which you sound like your ministry has, has integrated quite well into the conversation. I think Microsoft is w one of the uh, supporters with, with ICT for Girls, the initiative that you started, as well as the government and uh, other civil society organizations, I think it's key. No one of us can do it single-handedly and so um, all the right players at the table is always, is always a good thing. Thank you, Minister Khan. With, with that, I'd like to uh, just you know, pose a couple of questions also to the CEO of uh, Turkcell, Mr. Teziolu, who is here with us today. And uh, of course, Turkcell is one of the largest, if not the largest, telecommunications uh, company in, in Turkey. A lot of your focus over uh, this year, at least, primarily has been around data and data generation, looking at different vertical segments in education, health, and manufacturing. Can you share a little bit more about how you've uh, been able to do this successfully working within the, the multi-stakeholder ecosystem and that platform, and if there are any game-changing um, individuals and or groups, uh, how are you planning to bring those into the conversation? Uh, th thanks a lot. Actually, telecoms industry is, I think, an industry which has taken public-private uh, partnerships literally. Every $100 invoice we bill, 62 in my country goes to the governments as tax. So I think this is an important starting point because only one out of that 62 goes to the universal fund for building out economically non-feasible networks. And I think this is something probably in later that needs to be revisited because I think if we want to succeed in fourth industrial revolution, which is going to change entire segments of industries from tourism to agriculture to manufacturing to retail to telecoms, we have to deploy networks and we have to include everyone from the day they are born to the day they uh, basically uh, die we have to have lifelong, life-wide education and health services planned on this network. Now, I want to give a couple of examples which, which I think public-private partnerships 
really worked in our country. We have faced, about five, six years ago, a major influx of refugees from Syria. And Turkey was one of the countries really opened its borders and welcomed these people. We currently have three million refugees in Turkey. Only 10% of them are in the camps, and the rest are already integrated in the cities. And one of the things that we have worked with the government is registration and identity management of these people and facilitating the process of these people to have communication services. I'm very proud to say that today we have 1.2 million Syrian refugee customers, and I underline it, it's customers. And they are excellent customers, excellent consumers of data, and uh, this is actually not a luxury for them, it's an essential part of their lives. It's what connects them to the people who have left behind, what connects them to the people who has moved on to other countries. And what we have done as, a, as the company, we developed an application for them. Uh, and that application is free, and even utilization of that application is free. And we have worked with the government to have access to government services for all sorts of uh, refugee needs, including education to healthcare and so forth, so that it is provided in their local language. We have provided them tools for educating them in Turkish language so that they can adapt to the local conditions. And we provided, partnering with uh, international players as well, voice-to-voice -voice translation services. You know, we have about 550,000 refugees utilizing this application every day. And probably more than, you know, 30 million times the translation services have been used. And we see actually having a direct impact on these people. Why this is important? Because new technologies are coming to our lives. Technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, IoT. And the moment we think about these technologies, you know, we talk about humanless warehouses, driverless cars, as if, you know, everything is to get rid of the human. But actually, exactly the same technologies, if used for the human, serving underprivileged or groups with special needs in partnerships with government and private sectors, like the one we have done for the refugees, the impact is enormous. And I think that's really an area which excites me. The other project we are currently working with Turkish government is on education. The government decided to give tablets for every single uh, student. The project was initially started in 11, uh, 2011, and it was a failure because government took the project as an equipment procurement. Okay? They bought you know, tablets, they bought smart boards, and tried to deliver a service out of it. It failed. Now, they have come to the telecoms industry and they said, we want you to operate a platform. We will only do the content and you will run the platform on LTE network and we will provide you a service charge uh, for every student. We're talking about 15 million students and it will digitalize the country starting from age six. And this is something that excites me a lot and I think this is the right platform and perfect example of public-private partnerships uh, that is to come in the future as well. Thank you so much for that, uh, that, that uh, those examples that you shared with us, especially in the education sector. Again, um, you know, back to, to Minister Khan's point about providing the access and then the education piece. I mean, I'm, I'm sure in Turkey, of course, the infrastructure is one thing, the devices are another, but then who provides the education so that young people can learn? Are the teachers trained? Do they have the qualified uh, level of, whether it's ICT training, do they, do they uh, understand how that technology is used in and out of the classroom to advance uh, the economy? That's where the true change uh, really takes place. So uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, Minister uh, Zunad Pat Palek, thank you for your patience through this. And Bangladesh, of course, um, is planning for the 2021 50th anniversary. And part of this uh, is Vision 2021, which is part of their digital inclusion plan. I know Bangladesh has made a lot of advancements in terms of providing public access points for, um, for people to access the internet. And, and you have had a major role to play, of course, as minister in that. Can you give us some examples as we look to 2021? What are some of the more proactive ways that Bangladesh has worked in bringing some of these more, some of these players 
uh, together again to try to ensure that all the goals that were outlined in terms of Vision 2021 are met. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. And good afternoon to everyone. Um, our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina enshrined her vision to build Digital Bangladesh by 2021, what you have just mentioned, that when we are going to celebrate our 50 years of our independence. Our uh, target to become a middle-income country by 2021, and we have identified uh, four pillars to achieve Digital Bangladesh. So number one is human resource development. Number two is uh, pro providing internet connectivity to all. And number three is e-governance, and number four is industry promotion. And currently, uh, we are the second uh, most uh, online worker in terms of the online worker numbers, uh, according to the Oxford University report. And uh, uh, if, you, if you talk about how we are providing the internet connectivity all, and in last uh, one decade, uh, we have been able to uh, expand our internet connectivity up to the village level and uh, in last three years we have been able to uh, connect all the 18,000 government offices with a single uh, government intranet work and now we are uh, extending our uh, broadband fixed broadband connectivity up to the village level and uh, we are doing all this uh, network expansion um, in a public-private partnership manner, uh, where we have a partnership with telcos, where we have partnership with NTTNs, and also local ISPs. Uh, in Bangladesh, we have uh, near about 170,000 educational institutions, where more than 40 million students are studying now. And uh, currently, uh, near about 1 million uh, IT freelancers working on the international online marketplace, and we have a specific target to uh, provide jobs uh, in the ICT sector in in next three years. By 2021, it will be two million. And we are building 28 high-tech parks across the country, where uh, near about 200,000 uh, youth will be able to get uh, the jobs. And, and for that reason, uh, we are including all the ministries, all the government uh, departments in our intranetwork so that they can, uh, they can have the access to the high-speed broadband reliable connectivity. And uh, we have set up 13,000 digital centers where more than 200 types of government services are available for the citizens. And every month, uh, 600,000, like uh, uh, half, uh, six million people are getting government services. If you talk about uh, eight years back, there were nothing uh, e-governance services uh, for Bangladesh citizens. But in last eight years, under the prudent leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we have been able to um, uh, introduce 40% of our government services online. And we have a specific target to reach 90% uh, of uh, the government services will be online by 2021. Mm -hmm. Currently, we have 73 million uh, internet users and 136 million mobile subscribers, and we have a specific target to provide 100% internet penetration uh, by 2021. And for that reason, we have taken several projects, like uh, we want to uh, make Digital Bangladesh more inclusive, and for that reason, we are trying to involve more and more women in IT sector. Currently in Bangladesh, near about, uh, it's a less than 10% participation of women in IT sector. But we have a target to include 50% participation from women's side by 2030. And for that reason, we have taken one uh, unique project that is the Sustainable Development, uh, uh, sustainable development uh, for Women uh, through ICT. And uh, we are providing training for uh, the women. We have a target to create 10,000 entrepreneurs in ICT sector in next one year. And also, uh, we have a learning earning program where the secondary school certificate uh, and after uh, passing the higher secondary uh, school certificate, all the youth are coming to have 
50 days and 200 hours training from the government side, and we have launched six buses across the country where uh, the, all the remote areas we are trying to cover uh, with this mobile training buses. This bus is going to the remote areas to provide the training for the women. And we have a target in next two years, we'll be able to provide 166,000 training for the women. So that is why this internet for all is very uh, important and critical for Bangladesh. And we are uh, pretty much uh, confident that we'll be able to provide 100% uh, uh, internet access to the people of Bangladesh by 2021. By tw just in time for your golden jubilee. So <laughs> that's, that's great. Thank you so much for that, uh, Minister Palak. It's, it's interesting because I, I am actually uh, on the advisory board of the um, Alliance for Affordable, Affordable Internet. Internet. And congratulations uh, to, to your country. I know that they launched that program it. in Dakar um, in, in July, I believe um, that was. So of course, the uh, Alliance for Affordable Internet is, is a broad coalition of uh, individuals, of private sector, government players that are working to ensure that everyone everywhere has access to, to life-changing opportunities that the internet brings. Um, in respect of, of the time we have, this is, has been such a wonderful conversation and I didn't get to loop back with, with our panelists here. But uh, I, I know Minister Nsegemana mentioned the digital ambassadors. Many of our, um, uh, of our other panelists um, have also mentioned digital jobs, the online market space, this concept of the gig economy, um, not just providing the training, but also ensuring that people have access to employment and economic opportunities that the internet affords them through the gig economy. And this is um, a lot of what I'm hearing uh, uh, through the conversation. So uh, I would like uh, at this time uh, to wrap up this part of the panel. But before I do that, I certainly want to um, thank our panelists and then call on Baroness Sugg uh, of the UK to make a short remark about uh, the United Kingdom's government activities as they relate uh, to digital development. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I'd just like to say how proud it is to be part of the steering group for the Internet for All group. Um, we're working in poor and rural communities across the globe and formal settlements trying to improve connectivity and to facilitate new business models uh, to deliver services like water, electricity, financial services. We have a partnership with uh, GSMA and the mobile industry which has positively impacted 7 million people so far. One specific example I wanted to mention today is MCOPA Solar. Uh, which has provided people with lean energy projects across West Africa. To date, um, it's powered 500,000 homes for affordable solar energy, and we're looking to expand that program to reach 1 million homes by next year. And this enables people in those communities to make affordable short payments through banking platforms such as M-Pasa. Um, we can and should celebrate these successes, but one of the other challenges I wanted to raise today was the impact of penetration. Uh, we know that until penetration reaches 20 to 25 percent of communities, it can actually exacerbate existing inequalities. So I think in everything we do and everything we discuss today, we must specifically target those communities um, so that we don't miss the opportunity to ensure that the sustainable development um, affects uh, and enables everybody. So thank you for an interesting panel session, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you again uh, to, to our panelists. Uh, at this time, we will conclude the panel, um, unless there are any questions that need to be asked of the panelists at this time, any burning questions. Um, if not, we will go into our breakout sessions. Okay, so what I'd like to do quickly, we have five breakout groups, each uh, with a specific moderator who will talk about a theme. So um, the first group is going to be led by Yu Yun Park of the DQ Institute. Um, hello, my name is Yu Yun Park from DQ Institute. Um, I'm very glad to hear, oops. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that um, such a necessity of uh, digital skills and digital awareness uh, in connection with the internet for all. Um, I'd like to talk about the basic, basic education for first. 
uh, we often thinking about that when it comes to education. Um, this is a question. What are the digital skills that we need to teach our children in order for them to survive in the fourth industrial revolution? In other words, how can they stay relevant? How can they actually not uh, replaced by the, on the machines? But if you think about it, you know, I'm a mom of two children. I feel very bad when I compare my children as a competitor or a potential loser compared to our own invention. So I think we need to change our questions into how can we empower children in the fourth industrial revolution as the master of the technology, not the slave of it? How can, they empower, how can we empower them as a good digital citizen, not just consumer of it? So that means that we have to think the education more holistically. It is not just about the job creation. It's not just about the coding skill, which is important, but it's just part of it. It's not just about economic growth. I think the education should focus on the well-being of individual, society, and planet-wise. In order to do that, we think um, it is important to think about how to, what is the holistic theme of digital skills? Not just about the practical skills, but also about the soft skills. Unfortunately, digital space is not very safe. We know that social media has been playground for the terrorism, and there is so much prevalence of cyberbullying, more than 40% among the children worldwide. What about the addiction? And what about the privacy invasions? So, Internet for All is very relevant to address this online safety as well. Because when we observed the fast growth of internet penetration of 20% to 100% within a year, then children are left alone in this vast digital world without much of protection. So I'd like to uh, think about what is the holistic things we want to teach ch children. I think it is most important uh, to teach them about the discernment and critical thinking and how they understand about digital world, how they live in the digital world. And then when we know they have a basic life skills, they can move on to thinking about coding skills, the literacy skills, how to read, write, and participate. Um, in order to do that, we are launching also um, the global movement and a coalition approach together with the World Economic Forum, Mozilla Foundation, and others. Um, if anyone interested in this topic, please come and join in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yu Yun. Uh, the next uh, discussion group leader is going to be Mr. Joachim Reiter from Vodafone. There he is on the other side. Thank you very much. I'm Joachim Reiter. I recently joined Vodafone in its executive committee. Before that, I was actually in the UN um, working for the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, including working on ICT policy review for Rwanda. Uh, I would like to start by saying the panel has actually framed the discussion perfectly, and it's a very, very, I would like to thank the panelists for very insightful comments and sharing of experiences. I'm supposed to lead a panel on the digital infrastructure. Let me make four points in relation to that. The number one is that we all know, of course, that digital infrastructure and access to internet has immense economic social uh, benefits. World Bank has estimated if you increase internet uh, availability by 10%, you get a 1.38% GDP boost. Uh, WEF recently published, which I thought was brilliant, that actually fast internet access in Africa for the areas connected get automatically a boost of 4.2 to 10% uh, employment increase. This is a significant contribution, particularly in countries facing a huge uh, demographic, hopefully dividend, but otherwise could be, turn out to be a source of future instability and, and, and frustrations. So we all know this is important. Secondly, I think the panel framed it perfectly in the sense of saying digital infrastructure is a necessary but not sufficient condition to tap and untap these potential. My third point is, uh, and we all know that as of yet, uh, and men, particularly in developing countries, but it's also true for rich countries, is that predominantly the building of the digital infrastructure has been done by private investors. And in many developing countries, that has been through foreign direct investment. But we also know that 
despite these massive investments, which is also having to constantly be reinvested because the technology is moving very, very fast and capital depreciation is around three to 10 years for mobile telephony, for example. It basically implies that we still, despite this massive investment over the last generation, are having so many people offline and it was perfectly referred to by the panel. So clearly we're having a good starting point. We have a long way to go. We need to vastly accelerate. The question is, what should we do in order to achieve that? Uh, so my, uh, the panel that I, or the discussion I will lead is basically to try to uh, figure out what is needed by governments, by private sector, and by other actors to accelerate this development, to build the infrastructure for the last mile, as we usually refer to it, as well as what is needed to reduce the risks involved in this massive infrastructure deployment, which, by the way, is a similar question for all the SDG, which is ultimately about soft and hard infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ryder. Um, the third group is with Janet Longmore of Digital Opportunity Trust, and I just want to ask discussion leaders to keep the opening remarks to just a minute, please, if possible. I was told a minute, so I'll stick to a minute, yes, okay. Hi, I'm Janet Longmore with, uh, with DOT, um, representing hundreds of thousands of young women and men, digital social innovators who, as we speak, are actually in their communities building digital literacy skills and social enterprise skills with their peers. Sadly, the gender digital divide is uh, increasing. Uh, which represents a huge opportunity for us. Uh, we're very positive at DOT, and uh, in my mini survey uh, of everyone attending this forum um, before coming into the room, Eric has mentioned barriers, but the barriers that women are facing are social cultural barriers, uh, lack of relevant content, local languages, safety, security, uh, education, among others. So we have an opportunity to uh, look at this issue from a different lens, perhaps, and look at how we can be very action-oriented and, as DOT advocates, for deliberate inclusion of women, in the design of the solution. Because if we understand why women want to use technology, then we can engage with them to develop the solutions to overcome the gender digital divide. So I encourage all, um, all of you and uh, men in the room to join us. It'll be a very action-oriented session. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. And then, do I see Lauren? Yeah, Lauren, there you go. The fourth group is Lauren Woodman. She was sitting right under my nose. <laughs> Thanks, uh, thank you to the panel for your opening comments. That was very helpful. Um, I'm gonna lead a discussion um, around refugee connectivity. Um, and this has been a conversation of, that's been going on for some time now, um, and really looking at a couple of different things. Um, one, we know, and, and certainly many of us have heard, that when refugees are landing in Europe, the first question they ask is, um, where am I? And the second question they ask is, do you have Wi-Fi? Um, before they ask for food or medical assistance or a blanket, um, what they want is connectivity. And they ask that question um, for two reasons. Um, the first is to let their, their family know that they're safe um, and, and let them know that they've made it. And the second is to then access services. Um, we've done a pretty good job, frankly, in bringing connectivity to um, many of the refugee um, settlements that have happened in Europe over the, the last year or so. Certainly some examples like we've seen in Turkey in terms of using connectivity um, for refugees to access language training and jobs placement has been very promising. We have a lot of refugees that aren't in Europe um, and, and aren't coming through the, the current crisis where all of our attention has been focused. Um, and how do we start to address that as well? What are some of the models to help us with some of um, the more informal settlements or the um, early stages? Um, we've got some good examples um, from Dadaab in Kenya from several years ago and, and from Kakuma, but the current crisis um, that is happening in many other places around the world, um, we haven't quite figured out how to, to make that happen and what services we need to bring with, that, with those early interventions. The second sort of piece to that, of course, is, is that how then do we make sure that we are using that connectivity to provide services um, that these populations need, um, whether those be temporary settlement, which unfortunately is not often the case, um, or longer term settlements, and how do we put in place the right protections so that we can make sure that already vulnerable, vulnerable populations are not further um, victimized um, and that we, we give folks a path 
um, to, to greater success given where they find themselves. So we'll talk about all of that in 30 minutes because we're brilliant, we're gonna cover all of that. Um, but if you're interested in refugee connectivity, I'll be right back there in the back, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And the last discussion group leader is Neil Dunn from BT. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, one of the topics that Eric and Alex Wong and us have been looking at is, is um, this whole concept of adaptability. So I think the World Economic Forum is one of the few places where we can start to pull in civic society, government, private sector to look at how humanity is really struggling to adapt to the pace of change of technology at the moment. And I think the efforts around access and skills are commendable and the ethic around partnership is amazing. But actually the nexus issues that technology and its impact on families, communities, even democracy itself, and making sure that we have a deeper dialogue and understanding around the things that have always made us successful as humans in terms of our values are actually championed into the digital revolution as opposed to shaping humanity to fit the digital revolution. So what we were going to do in um, the um, fifth group is to um, maybe see if there's interest around looking at that whole concept of adaptability and focusing on in on things around empowerment. How do we actually empower people through giving them back control of their own data? How do we make sure that that data is true and accurate and not subject to being manipulated so that, you know, Minister from Rwanda, when you do get all of your people online, and I think what you are doing there is incredible that it's not a tool that's actually used against your government where people can actually um, use fake news and other things to overthrow government and other regimes actually can, can hack and discredit political candidates, but we can actually really champion truth and figure out how that can happen in the digital age as well. And I also think um, getting much better at scenario planning and foresight. I think one of the things that humans always do well um, when we come together is actually to look at these big issues and say what, what is acceptable um, for the future of work. If we are looking at the eradication of blue collar, well, what do we actually want people to do? Is there a rise of a whole new employment class, no collar, and how, how do we actually create that and what systems level change is needed to enable that? So I think the whole concept of adaptability um, is a build on everything the Alliance for Affordable Internet is doing and starting to think about how we can um, think a little bit bigger about what has made us succeed as a human race and really make sure that the digital revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, um, is, is uh, in sync with that. Um, and it's, it's happening through us and not to us. So group five over there. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Okay, everyone, and now is the time where we break up and we join these discussion groups to figure out what action we can take together. So please, uh, including the panelists, I invite you to join us in the discussion groups. Uh, there in the back, uh, you'll see the names of the discussion leader will mark the, the group. And please note that the filming will stop during this portion of the, um, of the session.